Hello, you're listening or watching DNA Today. We are a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in genetics. These are experts like genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and more. My guest today is the award-winning journalist, Bajal Travidi. She is a fantastic writer, I just have to say right off the bat. We are going to be diving into her first book, Breath from Salt. And if you're watching this on YouTube, this is the cover of the book. And obviously I loved it because I have so many sticky notes and highlights um, and I just learned so much from it. So thank you, first of all, for taking the time to write this book and chronicle you know, the journey that has been cystic fibrosis. I love it. The you know, beginning of the book, you write, it's a new lens through which to view the progress of medicine. Um, it's just amazing how much you've been able to document with this from like the discovery of the condition to the development of groundbreaking treatments. I mean, there's been so many advances for cystic fibrosis over the last 50 years and a lot of firsts in medicine. Um, before we dive into all that, because I have so many questions to ask you about it, can you describe what cystic fibrosis is for people that are not as familiar with the disease as we are? Sure. Well, Kira, thanks for having me on. For, um, that's a, a real privilege, and I'm happy to talk to you today. Um, cystic fibrosis is its a fatal genetic disease, and it's a disease that you know most often is described as, as a lung disease, but in fact, it, it affects the entire body. It infects the, affects the lungs, the sweat glands, the pancreas, the digestive system, and but it but it's the uh, the infections that that occur in the lungs that are actually the most deadly and and kill patients. And when it was first discovered, um, patients often didn't make it to their first birthday. Uh, but now uh, the the age uh, survival rate is age forty seven. So that's a huge improvement. And that's just in the last 50 years. I mean, it's just remarkable how, you know, as you said, going from it was an infantile disease that, you know, babies would die young from this. And now people are 47 and, and parents of their own children. Um, so it's just a fantastic example of how far medicine can come in just a few decades. Part of the excitement, obviously, were a genetic show. So that was the part that I was really intrigued in. And I would say a good portion of the book talks about the genetics and the genetic mutations and, you know, the information surrounding that. So the search for the cystic fibrosis gene was really a race, I would say. And you kind of capture that really well. And you're going along the journey um, there as just the reader. What techniques were used in order to figure out which gene housed the mutations that led to the disorder? I mean, why was this revolutionary? Well, they started the hunt for the cystic fibrosis gene back in 1981 in, in sort of in, in a very serious way. And in 1981, there was no genome. The human genome had not, the human genome project had not even begun. That would be in the 90s that that would kickstart. Um, so there was no map of, of human DNA. We didn't know what genes were on which chromosomes. It was essentially the Wild West. And so we had this disease, cystic fibrosis, and no one knew what caused it. So you have a completely it's like having an unlabeled map of America. And, and you have to find a location where the problem is. And you, you don't, I mean, you don't even know the roads, you don't know the towns. Uh, so they had to start from the very beginning and, and figure out how do we find a disease when we don't even know the cause. We don't even know what to look for in the DNA. And the human genome has about three billion building blocks so they would have to go through all of those three billion building blocks one by one and find the gene that caused cystic fibrosis. So that was impossible to do. So they, they basically figured out a hack, which was a brilliant, brilliant hack. And that was that they decided to collect the DNA from families all over the country, all over the U.S. and all over Canada. Um, and, you know, DNA from the mothers and fathers and the children who had cystic fibrosis and as well as their healthy siblings. 
and they would take the DNA from all those people and what they were looking for was a little piece of DNA that was carried by all the people that had cystic fibrosis, but not their healthy siblings. Um, so basically, you know, the cystic fibrosis mutation arose about 5,000 years ago. Um, it is thought to have arisen about 5,000 years ago. So they're looking for a tiny bit of DNA, a mutation that has been passed down from generation to generation um, and has now wound up in these children. And it's a tiny little piece because every time, every generation you get less and less from, you know, less and less DNA from the previous generation. So it was a, it was a massive undertaking. And um, it took basically eight years to find that gene. And it was one of the first human disease genes found. So there are so many firsts with cystic fibrosis, but I think that is probably one of the most significant. Yeah, I think so. And just seeing like, you know, all that it took to get there, as you said, I love that analogy of they didn't even know like where the roads were because, you know, putting it into perspective, we didn't have the first draft of the genome until what, 2001, somewhere around there. So that's right. This that's is like 20 right. ish years before that. So that's like a lifetime in genetics, you know, and we think about how fast things move. It is. And, and especially when when you think about how fast slow sequencing the genome was back then and you know I was in the lab for a little bit and it sleep sequencing was slow and we used radioactive isotopes and it was it was glacial so uh you know things have come a long way since then <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and after they did find, okay, this is the gene that, you know, mutations happen and that's what causes the disorder. Obviously, we said that was such a landmark discovery. There was a lot of excitement now of, okay, we found the gene, like we're going to be close to better treatments and hopefully a cure. And that led to, you know, discussions and, you know, clinical trials with gene therapy why were some of the reasons why a lot of this didn't pan out and didn't end up, you know, working out in terms of all the excitement that was there? Well, all during the 80s and the early 90s, there was a lot of excitement about gene therapy. So people thought, okay, in a human disease, uh, a genetic human disease, you have a broken gene. So what if we could give that patient a healthy copy of that gene? wouldn't that theoretically fix the problem? And there was a lot of early evidence that this would work. So a lot of animal studies and work was done in a few immune diseases um, where they proved that if you gave a patient a healthy copy of the gene in their bone marrow, they could produce normal blood cells and they would have a robust immune system and they could fight disease. But of course, cystic fibrosis um, results from a protein that is broken in every cell in the body. Um, so you have to get this, this gene, this healthy copy of the gene, into every cell. And this was back in the early 90s. And, and there was very, I mean, gene therapy, the idea of gene therapy and the early experiments, it was all just starting. It was sort of the beginning of the revolution. And the theory was so neat, right? You know, you've got a broken gene found the healthy one, let's just make lots of copies of the healthy gene and throw it into people. But with cystic fibrosis, it's a complicated disease. I mean, how do you get the gene into the body? So what they decided to try was they took the gene, they inserted it into a virus, um, and this virus was special. It was a cold virus, so in, normally this would be something that would cause you a cold, but they took out the bad DNA from it, so it was basically an empty virus shell. They put in the healthy gene, cystic fibrosis gene, and then they basically spritzed it into the lungs um, of people with cystic fibrosis. And they did this in a, you know, very small quantities because, you know, early stage clinical trials are largely for safety. And in a tiny part of the lung, they found that the gene actually entered lung cells, got into the cells, started making a healthy type of protein. And in a minuscule part of the lung, they had fixed the disease. But when they tested patients a little while later, 
it seemed that the gene was no longer there. The healthy gene was no longer there. It was no longer making healthy protein. It was a very transient effect. And what was more worrying is when they put this you know, virus carrying this gene therapy into the lungs, the immune system basically freaked out. And as it should, you know, as we know with coronavirus, when you inhale a virus and your immune system goes on full alert to kill that virus to get it out of the lungs. So sadly, what was happening in these patients was the immune system was fighting the therapy and killing it before it could do any good. And so that work in the mid 90s made people realize that, you know, hey, just because you find the gene doesn't mean that a disease is going to be easy to fix. And that was particularly the case with cystic fibrosis. And that was the case with other conditions too, that was trying to be um, treated in this fashion with uh, gene therapy. And, you know, we could have a whole episode just talking about, you know, all of that went into those early years of gene therapy. Um, The other side of it that was kind of happening, maybe similar time or right after, um, was just looking at okay, not just finding the gene, but let's figure out what are the changes in this gene that lead to the disorder. So it's not necessarily just one change, although there is one that is the most common. Um, You know, over time, there's been thousands of mutations, as we call them, um, that have been identified. But even though there's thousands, there's two main ways that it affects the protein. So if we're remembering back to high school biology or wherever you learned your basic genetics, we have the the basics um, of the, the dogma. And so with that, we have our our DNA, and that's the instructions for our proteins to be made. Um, So, you know, with that in mind, with the mutations that are there, what are those two classes of proteins um, or the two ways that it can be affecting the protein? Well, it was it was really interesting because when they first found the gene in 1989, um, they expected there to just be one mutation that caused all the disease. But actually, the, the mutation that they discovered only caused 70 percent of the cases of cystic fibrosis, which suggested that there were other mutations out there. And over the next couple of decades, they they discovered more than 2,000 types of mutations. And each of these mutations could break the, the, the protein in a different way. So um, about 5% of patients with cystic fibrosis have um, a mutation in which the chloride channel, which is the, the protein that's broken in cystic fibrosis, it's sort of jammed. So it blocks the passage of chloride in and out of the cell. And those patients need a mutation to sort of pop open that that uh, chloride channel. Um, And in the book, I called this uh, a door jamming mutation because I felt the need. I had to attach a picture in my brain. And it helped so much. I'm like a visual learner. So I was like going through with you. I'm like, okay, this is the one that does this. Yes. Yeah. So the door was jammed and you need a molecule to basically push it open and allow chloride to move freely. Now, the more common types of mutation ended up breaking the protein in a couple of places. And the the problem with this was that, you know, the protein didn't even get to the outside of the cell where it was supposed to be. It was floating around. It was so badly folded. It was like a broken origami structure that had, you know, where you'd skipped a couple of the steps. So the protein, instead of being on the outside of the cell, like a doorway, it was floating around inside the cell it's almost like you had a door inside your house and it was in the wrong location. So you needed a couple of uh, those sort of um, proteins needed a couple of fixes. They needed something to get them to the right location in the cell, meaning the outer cell membrane. And then they also needed another drug to open it up. So they had two problems. So people with those mutations would theoretically need two drugs to fix that protein. Of and, course, no one knew that it was even possible to fix the protein at that point. Yeah, so there, this was another, I feel like it, the book could also be marked by like all the first in medicine that we kind of talked about at the top of the show. And this was another one of like, can we fix a broken protein? And I had no idea that this is like the first drug that actually was able to do this and the first research that was happening with this. So, you know, with your analogy of like, you know, the door's jammed or the door's not quite where it's supposed to be yet. So those are the two main problems. 
Um, so when it came to, all right, let's figure out how to fix a broken protein. I mean, how did scientists attempt this? What was the first drug um, to start fixing this general problem with the protein? Well, when first, when the, the people that funded and, and sort of came up with the idea that maybe this might be possible, um, the group was the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And the, the head of that foundation, um, Bob Bell, and uh, the head of medical affairs at the time, uh, Preston Campbell, they were talking about this problem. They were frustrated. Gene therapy had totally bombed. That wasn't going anywhere. So they said, you know, maybe we can hire a biotech company or pharmaceutical company to try and fix a broken protein. Maybe if we can't put a new gene in there, maybe we can fix what's already broken in the cell. Maybe that would be easier. And so they went to a lot of pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies with this idea. And basically they were, you know, laughed out of the house. Nobody would listen to them. They were like, you cannot fix a broken protein. That's a crazy idea. Leave. Um, but one company, um, Aurora Biosciences, um, they took uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation seriously and they liked the challenge. Um, and that, that particular company was launched by um, Roger Chen and some of his colleagues. And Roger Chen discovered the green fluorescent protein. Um, for which he won the Nobel Prize. And he was intrigued by this idea that you could perhaps um, fix a broken protein. And so his protege, Paul Negulescu, um, started working with the foundation and he thought it was possible. He thought, yeah, well, maybe it is possible to do this. And they started working in cell assays, um, in animal studies, and building molecules, testing them on cells that carried this mutation, the, the cystic fibrosis mutation, and trying to fix it. So basically, they were doing large-scale screening with millions of cells and hundreds of thousands of molecules, dumping them on these cells and, and seeing which molecules would actually help the protein work. And over years, they were able to find a set of molecules that had the right qualities. And then this amazing, amazing team of chemists at Vertical, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, and that was the company that acquired Aurora, they started tinkering with these molecules that showed some promise and made them exquisitely accurate. So they made a molecule that was later called Kaleidico that could open, that was able to unjam the door for this first type of mutations. They went on to build molecules that, was a, that were able to fix the most common mutation, lift the protein to the top of the cell, and then open it up. So this, uh, this group of chemists, I, I just have the highest regard for them. They are brilliant people. And you know they didn't have much support in terms of chemists in the company. You know Everybody thought this was a nutty idea. Uh, but you know, they really, they proved themselves and they, they proved themselves so much so that they showed that orphan drugs could be wildly lucrative. I mean, at one point, I don't remember all the particulars with it, but Vertex, the only revenue they had was from this drug. And so they never thought they were like, oh, this is like a side project. We'll see what happens with this. And then suddenly they're like, oh, this is our only source of revenue. Like the tables have really turned. I mean, it takes a lot to get there, as you said. I mean, years and years and years and so much money has to go into developing these drugs because you're starting from screening all these, you know, chemicals and compounds and you're saying, okay, which ones are the ones that could become a drug after a lot of extra work? I mean, how does the money, you know, get funded for this? This is, you know, one of the more, you know, it's not by definition a rare disease, but certainly at the time, you know, more so, you know, less people knowing about um, the disease. I mean, how did the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, how were they able to raise all this money through the ventral philanthropy? I mean, to afford developing drugs, like they were the main source behind that money. Well, they were the main source of the, um, the early research. So basically, um, when they made a contract with Aurora Biosciences, this, this idea was so you know, out in left field, 
that, you know, they, they just basically gave them a little bit of money, you know, a million dollars. See if this is even possible. See if you can build a robot that can start screening these cells and adding in chemicals and detecting which ones might work. Okay, so if you reach that milestone, you know, another four million to see if we can scale up this project. And they basically kept increasing the milestones that needed to be achieved. And the way they were funding it was, you know, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has an amazing volunteer network. Um, so those volunteers were raising some money, but basically they realized they had to launch a capital campaign. And the person who led that campaign was Joe O'Donnell, who was, um, who is a father and his son Joey died from cystic fibrosis. And that's, you know, a primary um, thread in the, the story of Breath from Salt. And, you know, he is a very successful businessman in, in Boston, and he took it upon himself to, to raise the money that the foundation needed to fund this early development. So Vertex would not agree to fund the research until it was demonstrated that this was a viable idea. This could actually turn into a drug. So until the point where they started doing animal testing and clinical testing, the foundation paid for all that early research. And then when we moved into clinical trials, the company took over because that's when you need, you know, tens of millions of dollars um, to start funding clinical trials and, and the following research. But basically, you know, no nonprofit, no health nonprofit had ever raised money through philanthropic uh, donations and then used it to invest in a for-profit biotech company. That had never been done before. So the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was, you know, forging another new path, um, you know, and, and it led to the development of four successful drugs. It's pretty astounding. Yeah, I'm sure that a lot of other foundations look at their model and what they were able to accomplish with this and say, okay, how can we see that pathway and mimic that for ourselves just because it's, it's, you know, it's really brilliant that they were able to say, okay, we have royalties from, you know, this first drug, let's sell those royalties and the money we get, let's pour back into research. And just that cycle um, was just so interesting to me that, you know, and just being able to raise as much money as they did, especially Joe Donnell. I mean, he raised, was it like $250 million? Um, at least when the book was published, right. which was, you right. know, just yeah. in 2020, that, you know, for just one person, and there's so many other volunteers and so many people mentioned, you know, throughout Breath from Salt that had, you know, big contributions in there. But it's just remarkable that, you know, one person can really make a difference. And then you start compiling that. And, you know, this research is is being done. Um, and so many drugs coming out of it. Um, I mean, it was interesting, too, that how fast things were able to move. Um, not only just the money being raised, but how fast the research was happening, how fast the drug development was happening. Um, one of the factors of that seemed to be that the, was it the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that had the genetic registry? Were they the ones in charge of that? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So one of the early things that the foundation did, I mean, one of the amazing things about the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and I, I probably sound like a spokesperson for them, but I'm honestly, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, a big I, fan. I was, yes, I after writing this book, I am a big fan. Um, one of the amazing things that they did early on was they decided they weren't going to spend money on awareness for for cystic fibrosis. Every penny they raised, or as much as they could possibly do, um, would be invested in research to find out the cause of this disease, and then later on, after they had found the gene, to find a cure for this disease. And um, part of that was once they realized, um, you know, that so little was known about the disease, you know, the foundation formed in 1955 um, with a bunch of very, very desperate parents. Um, people just didn't know about this disease. Physicians didn't know about this disease. So to start learning about it, they created a registry of all the patients that were seen at their health centers. And they started compiling data on all those patients, the names, you know, the ages, what they suffered from. And, you know, once the gene was found, 
they started um, sequencing the gene for each of those patients to say, okay, these patients have this mutation, these patients have this mutation. And um, by the time that Vertex actually had a drug to test, um, Bob Bell from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation had made sure that virtually all of the patients that were seen at their care centers across the US um, were in this database, were in the registry, and that every person's mutation was known. And that was a key development because when Vertex actually had their drug to test and was ready to launch clinical trials, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation had this enormous registry of patients that were all subdivided based on the, the genetic mutation they carried. So they could basically personalize these clinical trials and base it on the genetic mutation. So in many ways, this was the first big personalized medicine um, clinical trial ever. Um, they've done this in certain ways for, for types of cancer, but this was the first time for a genetic disease where they had, they had designed drugs to cure a particular mutation. Uh, so the fact that the registry was there, the patients were lined up, they knew exactly what mutation they all carried. The clinical trials could be um, run very smoothly. And that's normally where um, a lot of drug trials fail because they can't recruit enough patients. But here, all the patients were ready they were used to actually participating in medical research because the foundation had made it clear that unless you participate in medical research, you will not get a drug. So the patients were good at advocating for themselves. I mean, they're amazing people and they have participated in so many trials, but they really made sure that they had these drugs developed for them. Um, so it was, you know, another first and now you know, parts of this book read like a manual, I think, for other rare diseases um, because, you know, they talk about launching a foundation, getting a registry, finding the cause of the disease, and then strategically investing in pharmaceutical companies to develop treatments um, that are very specific. So I think, you know, the, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation sort of laid the roadmap but it's a roadmap that others can follow. Yeah, certainly. I mean, reading it, as you said, it is kind of like a manual and just taking you through. And and also that you weave in, you know, so many families and patient stories within the book, too. So it really does read like a story. You're reading about people's lives and how it unfolds and, you know, who is getting what drug in the clinical trials and, you know, one one sister experiences, oh, wow, I'm, I'm starting to see relief from symptoms. I must have the actual drug. And then the other sister is like, oh, I think I might have the placebo. And, you know, really just feeling like you're, you know, along with them for the ride. Um, so it's just, it's such a fantastic read. Um, you know, again, breath from salt uh, for people that want to look it up. Um, I think, you know, I was saying this before we started recording that I feel like this should be required reading for anyone going into healthcare and, and medicine, because it just, it teaches you so much just through the lens of one condition, but just so much of just different areas of medicine. So, you know, I think I am certainly not the only one that, you know, really enjoyed the book. And I just have to say, you're such a fantastic writer. I think sometimes it can be intimidating to pick up, pick up a large book and you're like, okay, there's going to be a lot of medical terms, but you break it down so beautifully <laughs> with like so many, you know, different, um, ways of explaining things that, you know, you're, you're right there with you. So I just, you know, I'm just a huge fan and I just really wanted to thank you for taking, you know, so many years to put this all together so that someone could just pick it up and read the history of cystic fibrosis. I have to, I just have wanted to add in there, in addition to your very kind comments, thank you for that. Um, you know, there are so many patient stories, and one thing that was really important to me with this book was to tell the story of um, this disease and all the science through the lens of the patients and the families. So without the patients and the families, there would have been no book, and people were really generous um, when it came to telling me their stories. I mean, these are very heartbreaking stories in certain in certain cases, and People were open with me. They shared everything. I mean, lots of medical details. And 
if it weren't for those families, there wouldn't be a book because it's their stories that I, I found so compelling. And I wove the science and the history into their lives. So, um, you know, they, they are the backbone of this book. And that definitely comes through, especially, I think, with the O'Donnells being really at the center of the book and all the other other families with it. Um, thank you so much for just coming on. And I think we covered so much, but there's way more in the book. So people definitely need to check that out. Um, where can people find it if they want to read it? Um, it's on Amazon and it's on all independent booksellers as well. Um, Indie, Indiegogo Books, uh, Barnes & Noble, um, or you can go to my website. I have little buttons for them. Um, I can't remember them off the <laughs> yes. top of my head. But yeah, my, my website, you can find out about the book and, and anything else. Yeah, and we're going to link to all of that in the show notes for this episode, which is available at dnapodcast.com. So if you only can remember one thing, just go there and then we'll have all the information there. Um, and if you have any questions uh, about cystic fibrosis or about breath from salt, certainly email in info at dnapodcast.com. You can search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook to connect with us. And please, if you have a moment, go on to Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and review so that others like yourself can find the show. So thank you again for coming on and just sharing your wisdom with this. Um, I'm just such a huge fan and everybody needs to check out Breath from Salt. So thanks for listening, everyone, and join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics.